you've probably heard today's guest on the radio or read one of his 12 personal finance books. He built an investment advisory firm from scratch to more than $242 billion in assets. He exited in 2021 and shows no signs of slowing down. You're going to love his inspired money story. Episode 273 features Rick Edelman, author, investor, entrepreneur. You'll enter the workforce in your 40s. Then you'll take off for five years as a sabbatical in your 50s. You'll go back to school, get new education. You'll re-enter the workforce, probably in a brand new career that didn't exist when you were a kid. And you'll do this cyclically, not a linear lifeline, but a cyclical one. School, work, sabbatical, school, work, sabbatical. You'll do this until you die at age 120. Retirement will be a word that today's 10 year olds have never heard of. Hey, Inspired Money Maker. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Inspired Money, the show that brings you extraordinary insights and ideas to supercharge your financial journey. I'm your host, Andy Wong, and today we have a truly exceptional guest joining us, a pioneer in the world of personal finance and investing, none other than the renowned financial expert and best-selling author, Rick Edelman. Before talking with Rick, I wanna share that behind the scenes at Inspired Money, we've been hard at work. We'll soon be pivoting to a live stream podcast where you can watch episodes live and participate in the live discussion. Of course, you'll still be able to listen to the podcast just like you always do in your favorite podcast catcher or on YouTube. I hope you'll be able to join us live though, because you'll be able to engage with our guests directly and participate in Q&A. The plan is to go live on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern every week, starting on Wednesday, August 9th, where we'll host our first pre-stream, Unlocking Your Path to Financial Freedom. This pre-stream will serve as an introduction to the 100 episode live stream podcast series. We're gonna focus on how to make more, give more, and live more as we feature multiple expert guests in this segmented live stream format. For details on how to join us on this Inspired Money journey, go to youtube.com slash inspired money. In this power packed episode, Rick shares his groundbreaking approach to personal finance that not only helps you build wealth, but also makes the process surprisingly fun and enjoyable. We all know the importance of savings, but how do we turn it into a game that we look forward to winning? Rick has the answers, and you're about to discover the secrets to gamifying your way to financial success. But that's not all. We're diving into the fascinating topic of longevity and retirement. With advances in healthcare and technology, our lifespans are increasing, and it's time to rethink what retirement means. This is not your grandfather's retirement. Rick sheds light on how to plan for an extended life and how to make the most of your golden years with financial confidence and peace of mind. Stay tuned to the end because we'll be delving into a thought-provoking discussion on artificial intelligence, a topic that holds profound implications on our society from military applications to social dynamics and even existential threats. Rick's insights on AI will open your eyes to the world of possibilities and concerns that lie ahead. So whether you're looking to level up your financial game, prepare for a retirement that embraces longer lifespans, or ponder the impact of AI on our collective futures, this episode is packed with wisdom you won't want to miss. Now let's get inspired with Rick Edelman. Rick, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. 
Andy, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Rick, looking at your career, I get the sense that you were born an entrepreneur. Is that true or did you have to learn entrepreneurship along the way? Uh, well, I was certainly born into an entrepreneurial household. Uh, so I think that, yeah, it was second nature for me, you know, the, the whole nurture versus nature debate. Uh, my mom and dad owned their own uh, small business for my whole life. My brothers and I are all entrepreneurial. None of us ever had jobs. Uh, we created our own. And so, yeah, it has always been second nature to me. You and your wife, Gene started and built one of the most successful RIAs in the country. Can you take us back to those early days? How is it that you decided to take the leap from being a reporter into financial services? Yeah, my, uh, my degree is in journalism, communications, advertising, PR, marketing, et cetera, uh, from Rowan University. And I was a writer uh, and uh, uh, coming out of college and, and a reporter, as you said, and, and it wasn't ever my intention to be involved in the field of money. Um, I, I wasn't really interested at all in the subject. In fact, I like to brag that I never took a business class in college. Um, but in uh, the course of being newlyweds and young adults, uh, my wife and I had the same goals as everybody else. You know, let's buy a house. And we was interesting was the fact that as a reporter, I was writing in the financial trade press. Uh, wasn't my intent. I was just a, a journalist. That's the kind of publications that I got involved with. And that exposure allowed me to realize that there's more to this than I know, and I ought to probably go ask for some help. So we went to a financial planner uh, for advice on how to buy a house. It turned out that he was um, not a very good planner. Uh, let's put that mildly. He, he basically told us to commit a felony. He told us to lie on our mortgage application in order to qualify for the loan. Uh, and this really infuriated us. Um, he should have told us we're not ready to buy a house instead of telling us how to commit fraud in order to get it done. Uh, and that made us realize, you know what? Um, if this guy can charge this kind of money, providing this kind of advice, uh, imagine if he gave advice that was actually helpful instead of harmful. Uh, what kind of money might he be able to be earning and how valuable might he be to his clients? And so that kind of was the inspiration for us saying, you know what, we're going to teach ourselves how to do this. And then we're going to teach others what we've learned. And we're going to build a financial planning business out of this. Um, that was the impetus. So I quit my job and uh, got myself licensed and entered the financial advisory field. Jean quit her job and went to work for Payne Weber in their back office. And we figured she'll learn the back end of the business operations and uh, admin I'll handle the front end of the business with clients and advice. And that was the way it started back in 1986. Um, so it was not our intent, but it's how we fell into this. I want to ask you about inflection points. Like, what was the goal? Was, was it to just have a small business, to run a small practice locally? Or did you have aspirations to grow to something larger? Our goal was simply to help protect others from the experience that we had. Uh, we basically said we will accept anybody as a client and we aren't concerned with how much money they have or how much they can pay us. We're only concerned about helping them uh, achieve their goals and avoid what we had to go through. Uh, and our attitude was we'll help anyone who wants our help and there was no real expectation, no real plan, no real goal of how much money we might be able to earn. Uh, I created a business plan. It was uh, one page, and it basically called for us earning three thousand dollars a month, uh, thirty-six grand a year. Uh, our attitude was: if we can make thirty-six thousand dollars a year, um, we can survive, and that's good enough for us. Uh, and it's, I still have that business plan and it's, um, rather quaint, uh, when you think about it, uh, as we began, um, we began with financial education because we realized that's where this all begins. People make financial mistakes 
because of the lack of knowledge. That's the error we made. We went to a financial planner not knowing anything about mortgages, not knowing anything about planners or advisors, uh, and our lack of knowledge got us down a wrong path. So we realized that people have no financial knowledge in this country. Financial illiteracy is huge. And it's because we're not taught about money. Our parents don't teach us about money. You know, they'll talk to us about anything. Um, they'll talk to us about religion, politics, drugs, sex, but they won't talk to us about money. Uh, we don't know how much money our parents earn, how much money the parents have. We don't know about their debts, but we know everything else about their lives. Uh, when we go to school, K through 12, not a single class on money. You go to college, no classes on money, unless you're majoring in finance. Uh, and then it's about corporate finance. It's not about personal finance. You get into the workplace, no conversation about money other than here's a 401k, sign up for it, even though you don't know what it is or how it works. So we're financially illiterate. We're faced with financial decisions every day. Uh, credit cards and insurance and housing and buying cars and uh, making financial decisions uh, of every sort. But we are not provided the skills, the knowledge to be able to make smart decisions. And so we realize if we're going to be able to help people the way we want, First, we had to obtain the knowledge ourselves, which we did and we're really good at doing. And then we had to teach others what we've learned. And we realized the best format for doing that are seminars. And so that's how we began our business. And it took off pretty quickly. And it really became obvious fairly soon, Andy, that the um, ability for me to meet the demand was exceeding our capacity because it was just Gene and me. And so we began hiring other advisors and other staff to supplement us and support our efforts. And our attitude was, we will grow as needed to meet the demand. Uh, when the demand stops, our growth will stop. Um, that was nearly 40 years ago, and the growth has never stopped. Where today, the firm that we founded uh, is the largest uh, financial planning firm in the country managing $250 billion in assets for 1.4 million households. So um, it wasn't uh, the impetus to make a lot of money or to build a, a, the biggest business. Uh, the goal was to help as many people as wanted our help. And that was the metric uh, on which we, we devoted ourselves. A few takeaways. I see that one, the good news is that it is figure outable because you could figure it out on your own. I also see a silver lining that in your efforts to educate people, clearly there's a desire from people to do better with their money and they want to learn. That's despite not having opportunities in school or like having it built into the curriculum. To what extent do you think your marketing background and PR background really helped you? to grow the business. Yeah, I think you're valid on all those points. Um, number one, as you pointed out, money is not nearly as complicated as Wall Street wants to make you think it is. Banks, brokerage firms, insurance companies, credit card companies, um, the entire wealth management and, and asset management industry, of which I'm a major player, they all want you to think that this is all beyond your ability, that you have to rely on them. Trust me, I'll take care of it for you. Uh, and that doesn't make you their customer. That makes you their hostage. Uh, and it's in their best interest to overcomplicate things, which is why you get a prospectus that's hundreds of pages long, written by lawyers to be read by other lawyers, that is supposedly a public disclosure document that doesn't serve the public at all. Uh, and so you're right. This isn't nearly as complicated. Understanding the basic principles of money are incredibly easy. Ease, I mean, I do seminars for 10-year-olds. You can easily teach money to children. Uh, and children are really good at grasping financial concepts. So you're right. It's not hard. Second, um, people do want to learn how money works. We all realize that we're financially illiterate. We know we don't know what we're doing. And yet we also know that we're forced to understand so that when we do go to buy a car, we're not outgunned by that 
car sales rep um, who is trying to sell us something we don't want to buy at a price we don't want to pay. Uh, and so we are starved for the knowledge and information. When I got my beginnings in this industry, there were no outlets for financial education. Today there are, of course. Today there are unlimited resources, most of it free on the internet, which is wonderful. That wasn't the case 40 years ago. So the access to information has never been better. The collective experience we've all had has never been higher. And that is helping to improve, but we still have a long way to go compared to where we ought to be. The, 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 the third element that you mentioned, uh, which is why I was really good at this and able to um, provide the level of service uh, and education to consumers uh, is because of my college background. Uh, at Rowan University, it's one of the best communication schools in the country. Uh, they've, I, I'm honored, uh, grateful to say they've now renamed it uh, in my honor, uh, the, the Rick Edelman College of uh, Communication and Creative Arts. And the, um, the knowledge and skills that I learned there, everything from public relations to graphic design to uh, linguistics, uh, basically taught me the two things that matter in the world of communication. Um, and they teach this very clearly in journalism school. Number one, how to ask good questions. And number two, how to explain the answers in plain English. People don't realize that the New York Times is written at the sixth grade level. Uh, and we need to remember that complexity is uh, the enemy of knowledge, um, uh, that we need to make things clear and understandable. Use one word instead of three. Use one-syllable words instead of four-syllable words. Uh, you paint in pictures. Um, don't talk uh, in numbers um, because people um, don't think the way that uh, academics think. Uh, and so by understanding how people think and how people digest content, uh, I'm capable of making the information accessible. Uh, most importantly, it's interesting, it's entertaining, uh, and along the way it becomes informative. Uh, and that's something, uh, a skill I've learned over the last 40 years that most advisors don't have. All advisors are very knowledgeable, but they aren't necessarily good at explaining in plain English because that's not the area of training. Which I think is especially important when it comes to money. And maybe more, more today than ever, because as you alluded to, there's so much information at our fingertips, but there are also so many distractions. And I find that many people don't even want to address their personal finances because life gets in the way. I mean, you have to take your kids to soccer games and you have work priorities. So the last thing you're going to do is look at your 401k. So when you can simplify the message, it just encourages action, which is a good thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're, um, we're intimidated by the subject. You know, we're always intimidated about things we don't understand well, uh, and we are fearful of the unknown. So I don't want to look at my 401k because I don't really understand it, and I'm just going to be afraid of what the numbers might show me. Uh, whenever they give me a financial, uh, a retirement readiness quiz, I don't want to take the quiz because I know I'm not retirement ready. So I don't want to, you know, it's like, I don't want to go to the doctor. He's going to tell me I'm overweight and I drink and eat too much. Um, so I don't want to go. Uh, and it's the same thing with money. So uh, we put it off, you know, and all the surveys tell us the same thing. People spend more time planning their summer vacation than they plan spending, than they work on planning their retirement. Uh, even though retirement, if you think about it, is a 30 year vacation. Um, so, um, this is why I try to make it fun and interesting and actionable. Um, baby steps, something you can do right now, really simply, really easily, that won't be distracting, won't be challenging, won't be uh, something that requires you to sacrifice too much, that you can actually make fun, you can make it a game within the family, you can make it participatory, uh, and before you know it, wow, you're making progress, and you're starting to feel really good about yourself, and life gets better. Okay, so what's this game people should be playing? Oh, there are all kinds of games that we can play in the world of money that uh, are in our best interests. Uh, for example, my wife and I made a decision way, way, way back when neither one of us was going to be allowed to spend more than $25 without the permission of the other. Uh, we still have that 
uh, in place today, uh, or at least I do. I wonder if Gene does. Uh, and um, uh, what we discovered is that that radically eliminates unnecessary spending. Um, and it makes it a joint activity because now we're doing things together instead of her spending money and me spending money. Um, and not discovering what the other one is doing until the credit card bill shows up. Uh, now we're having something else to talk about on a regular basis. And we're engaging in joint decision-making over how we're going to spend our money. And it makes it more inclusive and participatory and, and fun. And with the end result, we spend less. Uh, another way that you can uh, have fun, and it's harder today. This is an example of something we did not in, in the past, was we never spent uh, – uh, coins. We only spend paper currency. Um, today, it's not really relevant because nobody spends paper currency anymore. We're all doing it digitally. Um, but there are now online sites that will allow you to um, increase your spending. Every time you do a credit card transaction or uh, a debit or a PayPal, you upload it to the full dollar. So if it's $8.12, you pay $9. And those extra coins go into a savings account on your behalf. And all of a sudden, you're saving money without even trying. Literally, you'll save 50 bucks a month this way without even trying. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can gamify uh, the engagement of personal finance that um, works to your advantage. The most important, the most serious thing we can do is to set a goal. Um, the most important thing to realize is the reason people spend money indiscriminately is that we don't have any reason not to do so. So sure, I'll buy a candy bar or a soda uh, without thinking about it because what difference does it make? Well, if we have a goal in mind, such as buying a house or buying a car or spending money on a vacation or buying jewelry or whatever it is that your goal may choose to be, by focusing on the goal, it helps us evaluate every other spending decision. As I buy that candy bar, I ask myself, will this purchase help me toward my goal of that car, that house, that bicycle? And if the answer is no, I don't buy it. And by foregoing small daily spends in favor of the larger important spend, it helps us keep on track and achieve that goal. So by goal setting, uh, we can really make a big difference in our financial success. Great tip. Rick, you, you mentioned getting into financial services at the start. It wasn't about the money. You wanted to help people. Over the years, you kept hiring advisors, you scaled the business, you sold majority a uh, majority stake in the business. There were mergers. What did that feel like as you grew this business into a much larger enterprise? And did your relationship with money change at all? No, her relationship with money hasn't changed, but our um, our material lifestyle has, obviously. Um, that was the... the um, beneficial side effect uh, of our business success, I would say. Um, people have often asked uh, me, you know, how did you, how did you become so successful? And, you know, people who want to become successful too financially. And, and I've met a lot of entrepreneurs. I've counseled a lot of people of the goal of wanting to start a business and wanting to become wealthy. And I've always found the same thing for people whose goal in starting a business is to make a lot of money. They, never do. I, I have never seen anybody succeed when that is their goal. For the simple reason that achieving business success in, in any industry, um, achieving that business success is extraordinarily difficult, uh, requires massive sacrifice um, of time, mental energy, uh, in many cases, physical health, uh, relationships, um, exclusion of other uh, ways you might spend your time. Uh, and people discover before too long that it's too hard and it's not, they ultimately decide it's not worth it. Those who achieve success don't have making money as their primary goal. They have some other achievement or accomplishment that they're trying to attain. Uh, for us, it was helping people 
who didn't have access to financial advice and who needed it. And our goal is to help them and as many of them as we could possibly help without regard to how much money we might make in the process. Making money, grading a profit was a byproduct. And in fact, I remember very clearly uh, early on in our business, the way I would track our success, our, our, our own personal business success, I would simply ask Gene how much money was in the bank. Um, my way of gauging our success was, do we have enough money in the bank to meet payroll this month? That was it. Um, and for a lot of years, the answer was no. Uh, we bootstrapped. You know, there was enough money to pay our bills. There wasn't any money to pay Gene and me. So there was enough money in the bank to pay our staff uh, and to pay rent, but that was it. And I remember saying to Gene once very clearly, I said, look, I'm making a deal with you. One day when we have $5,000 in the bank after we pay the monthly bills, we're going to the mall and we're not going to leave the mall until we spend the five grand. That's going to be our reward to ourselves for all this hard work. Well, it took another few years, but um, the day occurred one day. Wow, there it was, five grand in the bank at the end of the month, and we went to the mall. And we spent hours in the mall, and the only thing we bought were two ice cream cones. We couldn't bring ourselves to buying anything because we realized we had spent so much time and effort and sweat and sacrifice to earn this money we couldn't bring ourselves to squander it on stuff that we, let's face it, we were living just fine without all these years. And so we sheepishly went home and the money we decided the only place we could spend the money is back in the business. So we just continued for years reinvesting in the business and that's what allowed us to grow. Uh, and we just kept on doing that. And today the business is still doing that really. Um, and so when people ask, how do you do it and how do you make it happen? You've just got to decide what matters to you. Uh, and that's where you have to devote all of your energy. So when you hear stories that Warren Buffett drives an old Ford pickup truck uh, and he's living in the same house he's lived in for the last 50 years, well, that's because that's his lifestyle. This He didn't do what he does in order to become one of the richest men on the planet. That was a byproduct of his incredible business acumen. Same thing with the Walton family and the same thing, you know, with everybody. It's just the, it's just the way it is. Um, and it's, uh, so along the way though, of course, you know, you enjoy the, the material rewards and benefits. Those are all the toys. Uh, and we have fun doing all that. But if you're going to let your life be dictated by that, uh, I think you'll probably be relatively unhappy. Well, I, I'm hoping that even when you add a few zeros to that surplus, in the bank account, it still comes down to life simple pleasures, which can be just two ice cream cones. Yeah, I think so. You know, there, there's um, there's some there's a, an adage somebody once said, and it's absolutely true. I don't know who said it, um, but it's absolutely true. Money doesn't change people; it just amplifies them. Nice people become nicer, and jerks become bigger jerks. Um, and if you're expecting that your life's going to change because of money, it isn't. Um, it'll just be income amplified. So if you're happy in your lot in life right now, if you wake up in the morning with a smile on your face, you'll have a bigger smile if you're rich. But if you wake up with a frown and you think the world's all against you, trust me, you're going to feel that way when you're rich too. Right. So don't wait for the money. <laughs> Work on yourself, whether you have money or not. That's right. Rick, I want to ask you about Bitcoin, because I understand that in 2014, you did not follow through on an intention to invest bigger. Yeah. So take us back to, to that time. So I uh, was introduced to Bitcoin in 2012, um, pretty early. I'm, I'm a bit of a, known as a bit of a futurist uh, in the financial space. And, uh, and so I, I came upon Bitcoin fairly early. Um, I didn't get it. Um, I mean, who does when you first hear about Bitcoin? You know, it's like digital money. What? what huh? What? <laughs> so, uh, but there were some really smart people talking to me about this. And I'm figuring, all right, if these guys are talking about this, I ought to probably learn more because I don't get it. They do. So I better keep working on this and listening and thinking and reading until I do get it, either to decide that this is nuts 
or that there's a there there. So I spent much of the next year figuring it out and reached the conclusion they had reached. This is probably the biggest innovation since the invention of the internet in the 90s. Crypto is a big deal. So I began investing in 2014 and like everybody else who invested in crypto back in those early days, we all lament that we didn't invest more. Um, my wife and I um, decided to uh, how much we were going to invest and it was a lot of money for us, but not nearly as much as uh, I wish I'd done. Um, but uh, we have been investing ever since and uh, we were investing on a monthly basis. And so we've been investing through 2014 15, 16, 17, all the way through today. Um, and uh, my, my concern uh, was that as I talked with others in the financial industry, including members of my own company, um, they thought I was nuts. Um, I was really hard pressed to find anybody in the financial services industry who thought anything favorable of Bitcoin or crypto generally. Uh, and that was a big concern to me because I do believe, and this was even, you know, it, it was the strongest point back then when Bitcoin was $400, um, that this represented the biggest investment opportunity since the internet. And we all missed the internet. I was determined not to miss this one. So I realized there are two problems here. One is that it's the biggest investment opportunity, but number two, the financial industry is missing out. And since they're missing out, their clients are missing out. If the advisor doesn't get it, the advisor is not going to tell the client to get it. So that's why I created DACFP, uh, the logo you see behind me, the Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals. I created DACFP in 2015 uh, to serve as a crypto education company. Uh, I don't manage money at DACFP. We're not recommending any investments. We simply serve as an education vehicle to teach advisors as well as consumers about blockchain and digital assets, teaching uh, what this is, how it works, why it matters, why you need to pay attention to this. It's the same kind of conversation I could have had with you about the internet in the 90s. What is it? Why does it matter? Why should you care? How do you get involved? Uh, and you're going to get involved one day or the other, just like with the internet. Maybe you opened an AOL account in the 90s. Maybe you waited for Gmail in the 2010s, but you are involved in the internet today. And the same thing is with Bitcoin. You're going to own Bitcoin one day, your choice. You can do it now at high risk, or you can do it in 10 years when it'll be obvious to everybody. So um, I am... Uh, spending a lot of my time, not all of it, but a lot of it on crypto education, because uh, I think it is a, a huge opportunity that is not only going to help revolutionize commerce on a global scale, but present uh, a, a new opportunity for wealth creation as well. You've since stepped back from the RIA. What was that like? And does that mean you're just all in on back FP? Uh, no and no. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm no longer involved with Edelman Financial Engines other than serving on the board. Uh, I'm still their biggest individual shareholder, um, but I'm not involved in the daily activities of the company and I've not been for uh, years. Uh, I officially uh, left employment back in uh, 2021. Um, and um, like I said, I'm on the board and, you know, still aware of what's happening in the firm, but uh, not involved in, in uh, day to day. Um, in addition to uh, DACFP, uh, I also have my media company, The Truth About Your Future with Rick Edelman, where I do my daily podcast that you can download everywhere. Um, I also uh, do media training. Uh, we have uh, uh, a variety of activities. I do a lot of webinars and seminars and conferences. Uh, for mostly for financial advisors. Uh, I do consulting um, for a bunch of folks uh, on a variety of subjects. Uh, and we have several other companies. I own an Alzheimer's uh, research company. Um, 
we are working hard in the fight against Alzheimer's. I'm on the uh, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation board, uh, which is um, financing a lot of the research uh, into drug development to fight Alzheimer's. Uh, we um, are heavily involved at Rowan University, where we are uh, engaged in uh, not just the College of Communication and Creative Arts, but also the uh, Edelman Planetarium and the Edelman Fossil Park, where we are now building for Rowan uh, a world-class museum and visitor center, which will be open in roughly one year uh, at a world-class facility that is unique uh, on the planet that will allow school children to dig for fossils. Uh, and get to take home anything they find. Um, and so that's underway at Rowan University as well. And we have a related real estate development uh, going on adjacent to that park. Uh, we, uh, so we have a lot of different business activities going on uh, in addition to our philanthropic uh, roles. And, and these days, the only money that I'm really managing is my own uh, through our family office, uh, which is help, helping to finance all of the philanthropic activities. Uh, that we're engaged in. So we, we've done a lot of work with the National Park Service uh, uh, police, uh, helping them uh, build new stables for the horses you see uh, um, uh, by the park police in the Washington, D.C. Uh, mall from the Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol. Um, uh, we do uh, a lot of work with the Milken Institute. Uh, we're building uh, a museum of financial planning. Uh, and uh, in conjunction uh, with uh, the Museum of American Finance, uh, and we're uh, we have a lot of a lot of activities going on. So DACFP is my dominant crypto education activity, but it's not uh, at all the sole thing we're engaged in. Thirty forty years ago, you'd be considered at an age where you should retire and be off playing golf. It sounds like clearly that's not the case. Your entrepreneurial spirit is still very much alive. You're very busy. Do you plan to retire? I know that you've done a lot of work on longevity too. So what are your thoughts on your own retirement someday? Yeah, you know, 30, 40 years ago when somebody was 65, they were nearing the end of their life. And that was the thing, you know, you retired at 62, you were dead at 65. Uh, and that was the way it was for a very long time in this country. Uh, that's going away. Uh, and yeah, I have been very much involved in, in the field of longevity, uh, served for years on the Stanford uh, Center on Longevity Board, as well as Milken Institute's uh, Institute uh, on Aging. I've done work with uh, MIT's Age Lab. Uh, I'm uh, very close with Ken Dykewald, the CEO of uh, AgeWave. Uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work in this area. And what it comes down to is this. Um, all the scientists are pretty much in agreement who study this subject that if you're alive in 2030, odds are very good you will live to age 100 or beyond. Um, I'm 65. So uh, 2030 is coming pretty fast. Um, so I'm not anywhere near where my grandfather was when he was 65. Um, I'm barely, barely at middle age right now. Um, 65 is the new 35. Um, so, you know, you would never ask a 35-year-old, how come you're not retired playing golf? Um, so there's no reason to ask a 65-year-old that, uh, that, that question too. I mean, w w I'm healthier at 65 than my grandfather was when he was 65. And chances are I'll be healthier at 85 than I am today. Because not only of my lifestyle uh, with diet and exercise and sleep and stress and relationships and all that good stuff, but because of medical innovation, we're curing diseases rapidly. We are providing treatments for most of the ailments that affect us. Uh, we're going to, over the next 15 years, we're going to cure obesity, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory illness. We're going to cure cancer. Uh, and that means we're going to be living longer and living healthier than any humans in, hu in history have ever achieved. You know, it's hard to fathom that in 1900, life expectancy was 47. Today, life expectancy is 86. And by the time I am 86, life expectancy will be 110 or more. Um, so we need to live our lives as though we have a lot of lives to live. Uh, and that means we're going to be as engaging and productive and participatory in society as we have always been. Um, that notion of Whistler's mother, um, this old woman sitting in a wheelchair, she was 62 when he painted her portrait. Um, 
that is not our view of aging in, in America today. So yeah, um, one of the really fascinating statistics, Andy, is that more businesses are being started each year by people over 50 than under 30. So entrepreneurialism is strong, growing, and it's mostly by older Americans for two reasons. Number one, we've got the experience. And number two, we've got the money. When you're 25, you don't know what new widget needs to be built. You don't know how to build the widget and you don't have the funding, even if you wanted to try. But if you're 60 and you're fed up with all the widgets you've used in your life, you can do something about it. So entrepreneurial activity is strong, mostly by people my, who, who are my age. You mentioned the word particip uh, participatory. Do you think people should be open-minded to if they're going to live and be healthy for much longer then is a target retirement date possibly you're working until you're 85 or 90. yeah forget about retirement it's gone it's history um it will not exist in the future i first wrote about this in my very first book the truth about money i've written 12 uh bestsellers uh, my first book was published in 1997 and i said then that retirement was a 20th century innovation that would not exist in the 21st century. And that is proving true. Uh, retirement did not exist in the 1800s. If you were alive in the 1800s, you worked. You either shot or grew your food. You had to work to live. Um, the 1900s introduced the factory and the notion of a paycheck, working five or six days a week, and doing that for 40 years and then getting a gold watch and a pension and having a retirement, something that did not exist. It was the advent of World War II that the notion of pensions came about um, and for reasons we don't have to get into here. And the bottom line is that this didn't exist prior to World War II. And it was a new phenomenon that changed society in profound ways. And it made sense uh, as you get older, uh, you can't work anymore because of your health. Uh, you're close to death. You've only got three or four years to live. And so go ahead, relax. Um, but now we retire at 60. I mean, airline pilots are still required to retire at 65. School teachers get full pensions uh, when they're in their 50s. Uh, military get full pensions in their 40s. Well, they're perfectly healthy. They're not financially secure yet because they're only in their 40s or 50s and they're bored so what are they going to do golf all day that gets old really fast they're going to garden well first of all they call it landscape design it's expensive these days um, so they got to do something partly for the money i need to earn a living or at least supplement my income for my pension and social security and partly because i want to i enjoy what i do school teachers love to teach the only reason they quit teaching is because they have to pilots love to fly they don't want to have to stop. And if you're perfectly healthy, keep doing what you're doing. Better yet, quit doing what you were doing and go do something new. Reinvent yourself. And so we're finding colleges now have massive numbers of students who are over the age of 60 because they want to reinvent themselves. Um, I'm starting brand new businesses that have nothing to do with the RIA that I've been running for 40 years. This is new and exciting and different. Um, engage a passion. Uh, and we can do this for the next 20 or 30 years. People are getting college degrees in their 70s and 80s. They're learning how to play the piano. My father learned how to play the piano when he was 80 years old. Um, so this is something we've never been able to do before. Society isn't prepared for this uh, because nobody taught us when we were growing up that we would have a life after work. Because it never happened before. Nobody in human history ever had a life after work. Uh, now, for the very first time, our generation does, and the baby boomers are leading the way, and those who are following us, the millennials, the Gen Xs, the Gen Zs, and Gen Ys, are all watching the boomers saying, wow, what's life going to be like for me when I'm 75 or 95? The notion of retirement at 60, gone. This is why you're seeing such resistance to the return to office environment. Because younger generations are saying, look, COVID was horrible. I didn't want to have to go home. But now that I did, this work from home gig is really pretty cool. I really like deciding on my own, when am I going to put in the hours? 
let me decide to go play pickleball at 2 in the afternoon and get my dry cleaning at 10 a.m. I don't want to have to go into the office at 9. I don't want to have to take a one-hour lunch at noon. I don't want to have to get on a subway with everybody else at 5. Let me make my own hours. I'll get the job done. I'll be productive. I'll perform. But let me do it on a beach. Let me do it on a mountaintop. Let me do it while I'm walking my kid to daycare. Let me do it on my own volition. This is why people are loving this. This is why you're starting to see four-day work week uh, um, examples and tests being run all around the world that are proving highly successful. This is why you're seeing city and state governments issuing um, universal basic income to poor people, just giving them free money to help support their lives and improve their circumstances. We are reinventing society as we are recognizing that as we are living to age 100, the notion in the past, we only mapped out our life to age 65. At Stanford, we call it the new map of life. You know, you're born, you go to school, you get a job, you retire, you die. That's the map of life, linearly. That only went to age 65. We now have an extra 40 years to tack on. What do you do with it? How do you handle it? So Stanford's redesigning the map of life for society. And what we're discovering are that we're going to expand it. The notion of K through 12, it's going to be K through 20. There's no reason to go to college in your 20s if you're going to live to age 100. We're going to go to K through 12 into our 20s. You're then going to take several years off and go do Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, U.S. military. You're going to experience the world. Then you're going to go to college and you'll graduate not in four years or six years, but in 10 years in your mid-30s. You'll enter the workforce in your 40s. Then you'll take off for five years as a sabbatical in your 50s. You'll go back to school, get new education. You'll re-enter the workforce, probably in a brand new career that didn't exist when you were a kid. And you'll do this cyclically, not a linear lifeline, but a cyclical one. School, work, sabbatical, school, work, sabbatical. You'll do this until you die at age 120. Retirement will be a word that today's 10-year-olds have never heard of. I did read an article, and I can't remember if it was Wall Street Journal or which publication, but it was quoting a lot of the research from Stanford's Longevity Center. And that's what it was talking about. It was talking about having different phases of your life. And then, of course, you can work more physical jobs when you're younger. And then when you're older, you, you may enter an entire new career that is not physically demanding. So you're just evolving through life. You. Rick, you wrote your book, The Truth About the Future, I think that was 2017. Like since then, the world has been turned upside down by a global pandemic. AI development is advancing at an incredible pace. Where are we today? Like where, are the, where do you see the opportunities for people to focus on right now? Yeah, uh, pretty much all the predictions that I made in that book in 2017 have come true, uh, or they are in the process of coming true. And not all of the predictions are good ones, meaning uh, you know, there's one chapter in particular called The Dark Side, which talks about the negative aspects. One, among other things, the book has a prediction about a global pandemic that will kill 20 million people. That was 2017. Um, and uh, hello, uh, that happened three years later. So um, the book talks about um, the technological innovations that are altering every aspect of life on the planet. Um, AI and robotics uh, are dominant in our conversation these days. Um, crypto, big data, um, you know, meaning the storage of, of all of our data online, the cloud. Um, Nanotech, biotech, bioinformatics, 3D printing, um, all of these things are, are massively huge. I mean, we, we don't notice what's happening with nanotech um, because it's so slow, we don't even pay attention. But think about it. If you're old enough, uh, like me, you remember uh, a desktop computer um, with floppy disk drives. Um, nowadays, you know, that desktop became a laptop. The laptop became... Um, uh, you know, a device like this that sat in your hand. And then that was replaced by this, which has more computing power, my Apple Watch, than was on the space shuttle. Um, by the end of this decade, this Apple Watch 
will be smaller than the grain of sand and it'll be implantable in the human brain. That's what's coming just this decade. Um, we have to recognize the incredible uh, reduction of cost of computer technology and therefore the ready availability of it. Uh, our cars have a massive amount of uh, technology in them, uh, which is what's allowing for the invention of self-driving vehicles. And soon, by the end of this decade, self-flying vehicles. Um, so those are going to come probably sooner than self-driving cars will be self-flying vehicles. Uh, and so uh, all of these innovations are really very exciting. Um, artificial intelligence um, is changing things extraordinarily rapidly. Uh, crypto is as well. Robotics is changing uh, all of it. Um, some of it not for the good, um, for obvious reasons. Um, we all recognize the concerns of fraud and abuse and manipulation as a result of computer-generated images and information. Um, we have to figure out how to hold this tiger by the tail, but it is Pandora's box. The box is open. There's no going back, uh, and it is disruptive. It is highly disruptive. Um, for example, uh, the day will come pretty soon where uh, technology will be able to determine whether or not you are lying. Now, think about that in a court of law. Uh, in fact, think about that next time you go on a date. Um, so if you are in an environment where, no, where it is impossible to lie, among other things, poker is dead. Um, so um, we have to recognize the incredible implication of these technological developments. And those are silly examples. Let me give you a more serious one. Uh, robotic activity in the military. Uh, right now, the command control system is all dictated by humans. It requires a human being to pull a trigger or to launch a missile. But we have the ability for robots to do this. I mean, we were already flying drones, uh, and they can be done autonomously. Well, why can't a robot decide, evaluate the scenario, and decide to pull the trigger? Well, we realize that ethically that's a problem, and the U.S. military and the Defense Department has declared that will not happen. That is in, uh, unacceptable. So the officers retain command and control. But what if the U.S. robot, operated by a soldier remotely, is facing an enemy robot that is operating autonomously? Arguably, the enemy would fire first, destroying our robot. Would we not have a choice but to reply in kind and allow our robot to fire first autonomously? It's a slippery slope. And some people refer to all of this as Skynet, otherwise known as the Terminator. Um, so some of this isn't very pleasant. When we look at the pandemic development, um, there's already been an example shown where we are able to take uh, AI um, technology and create brand new molecules. And these are being used by scientists to develop uh, potential treatments against uh, cancer uh, in innovative ways far faster than we ever could have imagined before. That's pretty exciting. But somebody as an experiment used AI to see if they could develop a molecule that rather than curing cancer would cause it and thereby obliterate humanity. And they discovered that the AI was able to do it just as easily a, a, a cause as it could a cure. So the technology is scary uh, as well as exciting. Uh, and we need to be prep, prepped on this so that we can make sure we're getting the benefits of this tech rather than the negatives. And not just from an existential perspective, but from a social perspective. Uh, robots put humans out of work. AI puts humans out of work. Is that good or bad? Uh, the answer is both. Um, it eliminates redundant jobs. It eliminates boring jobs. It eliminates dangerous jobs, low-paying jobs, mundane jobs. But it's still eliminating jobs. If we don't replace the boring, bad, mundane, low-paying jobs with better, creative, opportunistic jobs, then we've done ourselves a disservice. So we have to figure all this out. My book, The Truth About Your Future, uh, lays it all out pretty clearly of the world we're now finding ourselves living in, and very importantly, the investment angle to this, because there is huge investment opportunity here. 
Bottom line is this, Andy, if you are investing in companies that were successful in the 20th century, you'll fail this, this decade. You need to invest in the technology of the future. Uh, and that's why I spend a lot of my podcast talking about those investment opportunities because most people are not familiar with them uh, and they're very, very exciting. I love the blend of your um, personal finance and like futurism and technology. Well, it's, you know, per, as a financial planner, you know, I'm planning, it's all about the future. I'm not a historian. That's what accountants are. You know, accountants document the financial past. Tell me about last year's income on last year's tax return. I'm a financial planner. I care more about the future. I don't care how, where you are in life. I don't care how you got here. I care about where you want to go. Uh, and so I care all about the future. Um, I say that with a little bit tongue in cheek. Our history matters incredibly much. I'm a huge fan of American history. Uh, and my wife and I are very much involved in, in uh, 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 Mount Vernon and uh, a variety of other uh, American history sites. Um, but the, you know, we need to know where we came from. We need to know how we got here. But from a personal financial perspective, too many people are hanging on to the past. They're living in the past. Uh, they're hoping that what worked in the past is going to work in the future, and it won't. It's a whole new world. We need to get on with the new world. Well, Rick, you've given us a lot to think about, uh, thinking about the future and possible areas for investment. You also talked about immense business success as well as giving back. I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, uh, I don't spend, I, I don't know if I do. Uh, su success is uh, in two phrases, I guess, absolute and relative. Um, it's easy to engage success on a relative scale. You know, you just, and we as Americans love to do that. We love to keep score, um, the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. Um, and there are lots of lists out there, uh, lots of metrics that you can compare your success with, uh, your progress with, to see how you're doing compared to others that can benchmark you to see if you're doing as well as you ought to be doing relative to peers. Um, and so that's one way is on a relative scale. But I think more importantly is what matters is an absolute scale, just based on you and your goals, your aspirations, your preferences. Um, what makes you happy? Um, you need to decide that first. If you don't know who you are, uh, you're not going to like who you become. Um, so you need to decide what matters to you first. Uh, and it's not cannot just be money. It's got to be relationships uh, and family and society and health. Um, and it's got to be fairness and it's got to be uh, social on a large scale, meaning um, within your community, within your state, within this country and within this world. Uh, we are all impacting each other. Uh, and we've got to uh, evaluate all that in an absolute basis. Uh, bottom line, am I making the world a better place? This may be a personal question, but to what extent is there a spiritual component to that? For sure. I think, uh, you know, I may not have stated it because to me it's kind of in obvious. So I think I'm glad you raised it. Um, I think we need to have uh, a spiritual component. Uh, we'll each decide for ourselves um, what that path uh, is. I think all of this is more journey than destination. Um, I. Um, believe very much in the fact that this is a journey. I, you know, I, I haven't achieved anything. Uh, I'm in the process of achieving. I've made progress along the way. Uh, and our spiritual side can help very much guide us when we run into the detours and distractions and um, unfortunate turns that we weren't expecting or, or wanting to, to see. The one thing I would add to our spiritual journey is that too often I encounter people who are engaging in a belief system that is merely what they were raised to believe, rather than independently deciding that this is right for them. And where it gets particularly damaging is when that belief system encompasses views that are harmful to others. Um, so we need to evaluate um, 
what our belief system is ought to be, whether it is, uh, whether you want to call it spirituality or religion, organized or not, um, I think that it is an integral part of, of who we are and will aid our journey and help us achieve that level of success in an absolute sense that, uh, Andy, I think you were referring to. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Tell the Inspired Moneymakers where they can follow you and where they should find you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty well available everywhere out there. Just Google Rick Edelman. Rice Delman is how you spell it. Uh, and uh, you can reach me at uh, dacfp.com, D-A-C-F-P.com, or at The Truth About Your Future. That's my podcast, uh, The T-A-Y-F dot com. And I'm everywhere on social media, Twitter, Instagram. Well, you can't call it Twitter anymore, can you? Uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook, you name it. X is uh, the new vernacular. What a wonderful example of telling, showing us how we have to live into the future. Let's blow up one of the biggest brands on the planet because it's too old and out of date. And it didn't even exist 20 years ago. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Andy. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Rick likes to say it's easier to live in the present when you have the next 20 years figured out. So my favorite Inspired Money moment was rethinking the when, what, and how of retirement, what it might look like in the future. Many people do not like the idea of possibly working into their 80s or 90s, but Rick makes a good point that good health and living longer changes the outlook for stopping work at 65. What do you think? Drop a comment or find me on social media. I'd love to hear what you think. Before you go, please subscribe to my email at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. Every two weeks, the Running Me team writes an email that highlights investment data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.